Uh, good afternoon. The first item of business this afternoon is portfolio questions, and the first portfolio is COVID-19 recovery and parliamentary business. I'd remind members there's a couple of groupings, uh, questions one and three, and then questions two and four are both grouped, and therefore I'll take supplementaries on those questions after both have been uh, answered. Um, there is quite a bit of interest in this portfolio and the next one, so the usual request for questions and indeed responses to be as brief as possible. And I call question number one, Sandis Kohani. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will propose scheduling parliamentary time to debate strengthening the scrutiny role of the Parliament in holding the Scottish Ministers to account. Minister George Adam. Thank you, President Officer, and I thank Dr Gulhani for his question. The Scottish Parliament is responsible for all matters relating to its function and internal operation, and it is for the Parliamentary Bureau to recommend the plenary business schedule to Parliament. The Government would encourage any member wishing to propose reform of current parliamentary procedures to raise such proposals with the Standards, Procedures and Public Appointments Committee. The Government stands ready, if invited, to discuss any reform proposals, and earlier today I met with Donald Cameron to discuss his proposals for parliamentary reform in what was a very productive meeting. Dr Gulhani. Minister, parliamentary scrutiny is so important in a democracy, as it means we get to challenge the Government on its failings. And as we know, there are too many to count from this SNP government. We know that the SNP do all they can to suppress scrutiny, as we've seen from their attempt to stop the public from viewing their leadership hustings. To disprove this notion, could the minister commit today that his government will not be taking away any opposition debating time? Minister, then, could you move the microphone slightly towards you, please? Yes, no problem. Uh, well, most of that, presiding officer, was complete and utter nonsense from the member, with the greatest respect. But as I mentioned in my previous answer, I had a very constructive meeting with Donald Cameron regarding his proposals uh, to, uh, and look forward to his future uh, proposals coming forward. Now, one of the things I would say to Dr Gulhani is Mr Cameron did this in a very constructive manner. If we are wanting to, if he wants to work with the Parliamentary Bureau, I would ask him first and foremost to talk to his own business manager and take it from there. And question number three, Stephen Kerr. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government whether it will propose time for parliamentary debate on the effective scrutiny of Scottish ministers. Minister George Adam. Thank you, President Officer, and thank Mr Kerr for the same question. Uh, as I just confirmed in my answer to Dr Gulhani, I would reiterate that this Parliament's responsibility for all matters relating to its function and internal operation. And Stephen Kerr. Deputy President Officer, I know that the Minister is a committed and passionate parliamentarian and he is as keen as I am to safeguard the reputation of the Scottish Parliament. And he will know, and I also know, that he will be very familiar with the obligations of the Ministerial Code. Yesterday, Minister Lorna Slater made no serious attempt to answer a question that was asked of her four times. And there are other examples of ministers reverting to scripted answers, even when they have bear no relation to the question asked. As the Parliament's man in the government, will the minister remind his colleagues, as was highlighted by the presiding officer yesterday, that there is an obligation, more born of respect than anything else, to fairly and squarely address the questions being asked of them in this chamber? Minister. Thank you, President Officer, and I thank Mr Kerr for that supplementary. And my answer would be that uh, on many occasions Mr Kerr and I have had uh, our interpretation of answers and discussions will have been entirely different, and it is down to the individual as to what they interpret the answer to be. But I, like my colleagues, take our role in Parliament very seriously, as does my uh, colleague Lorna Slater. Question number two, Alistair Allen. To ask the Scottish Government what assessment it has made of any potential impact on turnout at future Scottish Parliament and local authority elections of the introduction by the UK Government of voter ID requirements for elections to the UK Parliament. Minister George Allen. Thank you, President Officer, and thank Mr Allen for that question. The, the requirement for voter ID was introduced by the UK Government for reserved elections. Voters at devolved elections in Scotland for the Scottish Parliamentary and local government do not require voter ID. The Scottish Government remains strongly opposed to it and has concerns about the potential for confusion and disenfranchisement of uh, voters. We will look closely at the operation of voter ID in local government elections in England this May, and my officials and several electoral administrators from across Scotland will be attending some of the polling places as observers. 
I thank the Minister for that reply. Given that the incidents of uh, voter fraud that this measure purports to tackle are extremely rare, as far as anyone can establish, does the Minister believe that this measure has been introduced in good faith, or is it simply a way for the Tories to try and cling on to a couple of last remaining seats at the next UK election? Minister. I think uh, Mr Allen made his point uh, clear there, but the introduction of voter ID will no doubt make it more difficult for some voters to participate. That is why this Parliament has rejected going down that route for all elections. Any policy which risks excluding voters should be, President Officer, opposed. And question number four, Bob Doris. To ask the Scottish Government what steps it is taking to increase voter turnout in both Scottish Parliament and local government elections. Minister. I thank Mr Doris for that question. And turnout at the most recent Scottish Parliament election in 2021 was at 63.5%, an increase of 7.7% from the election before. At local government elections in May 2022, turnout was 44.8% a 2 per cent decrease from 2017. The changes in turnout are a result of a range of factors, and we have been seen in the past voters will turn out in greater numbers when they are engaged. This is not something the government can wholly influence, but our ongoing consultation on electoral reform seeks views on how to improve voter registration and how to make voting more accessible. Bob Doris. Uh, Presiding officer, votes must not just be cast in large numbers, they must also count. And that's the concern I have within Canal Ward in my constituency, which had more rejected uh, ballot papers than any other council ward at the 2023 elections, three times the national average. I've raised these concerns constructively with the Electoral Commission. Can I ask the Minister if he'll meet with me uh, to discuss my suggestion the Electoral Commission has a statutory duty to make an impact or to reduce the levels of such spoiled papers, as well as other specific ideas I have to make sure voters' votes actually are cast and counted and not inadvertently spoiled. Minister. Thank you, President Officer, and thank Mr Doris for that question. As always, I'm happy to meet with Mr Doris to discuss any of the proposals that he has. Uh, but I'll reiterate what I said previously to Mr Doris in this chamber, which is that I agree we must do whatever we can to ensure no one loses their vote because they do not understand how to complete this ballot paper. I am pleased to hear that Mr Doris has had constructive engagement uh, with the Electoral Commission and others who have a key role to play in supporting and educating voters. I will consider what more can be done on this issue and will take forward uh, after electoral reform consultation closes. Question number five, Oliver Mundell. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on how its COVID recovery strategy is supporting the tackling of health inequalities including in relation to accessing key services such as dentistry. Cabinet Secretary. President Officer, the Scottish Government's COVID recovery strategy is addressing the systemic inequalities that were exacerbated during the pandemic and includes a focus on the well-being of children and young people. Following restrictions on dentistry during the pandemic, we introduced a new enhanced examination from February 2022, targeting oral health inequalities, particularly in children. The latest statistics show that over 1.6 million NHS examination appointments were completed between April and October 2022, which includes 440,000 child examinations from February 2022. This means we are on course for over 3.5 million contacts in the 2022-23 financial year, an increase of 40% in NHS dental activity compared with the previous year. All of them were there. Cabinet Secretary for that answer. I'm inundated by constituents who weren't able to see a dentist during uh, COVID and who now find that their NHS dentist has gone private. Not dentists that have left or stopped practising, just ones that will only see patients if they pay. Uh, does the Deputy First Minister recognise a health inequality this perpetuates and will he use his cross-governmental uh, uh, role in coordinating the COVID response to see what more can be done uh, in the time he has left. Thank you. Cabinet Secretary. This is a, you know, an important issue that Mr Mundell raises, and it's important that people have access to NHS dentistry services. There is obviously um, you know, people in some circumstances opt for private dental care. In, in other circumstances, um, we have to make sure that that is provided. I know that NHS De Vries and Galloway, um, in, uh, in relation to the constituency points that Mr Mundell 
has raised um, are focusing on improving the registration levels through the work of the local dental task force. And I understand that up, that up to 4,000 additional NHS registrations have been made available since the new year in the Dumfries and Galloway board area. Now, that's an encouraging first step, but I recognise the importance of ensuring that there is an effective NHS dentistry service available in all parts of Scotland, including in Dumfries and Galloway. Got a number of supplementaries. Want to get them all in, but again, brief uh, questions and brief answers. First, Paul Sweeney. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Can the Deputy First Minister please confirm when the Scottish Government will provide the British Dental Association with the costings associated with the revised Determination 1 so that formal negotiations on payment reform can commence? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, I'm afraid I don't have that information to hand, but I'll write to Mr Sweeney about it. Thank you, Liam Martin. Thank you. Um, we must face up to the reality of Brexit, given that more than 60 per cent of the dental workforce is European. And before the EU referendum, consistently well over 500 dentists trained in the EU and after registered in the UK. Well, the Cabinet Secretary outlined the measures being taken to mitigate these challenges with a view to sustaining a rural dental workforce. Cabinet Secretary. There is a general uh, issue within our society, Presiding Officer, about the availability of skills in the post-Brexit environment. We are seeing some of the hard realities about the uh, contraction in the working age population within Scotland now presenting themselves. These were things that were a substance of real worries 20 years ago. They were alleviated by uh, our participation in the European Union and the free movement of individuals. They are now an acute threat to our society today. So we have to recognise that. In relation to the specific points that uh, Gillian Martin raises with me, um, we have put in place um, a number of measures to assist in the recruitment and retention of dental staff um, for uh, their fiscal incentives for newly uh, qualified and trainee dentists. Um, and despite the workforce challenges that um, we face, we remain in a positive position with relative strength of 57 dentists per 100,000 of population providing NHS dental services in Scotland compared to 43 per 100,000 in England. And briefly, Willie Rennie. I recently met with local NHS dentists in, in North East Fife who report a significant backlog that they're having to work through, but there is a significant increase in decay because the patients have been waiting for so, so long. They are concerned, however, that they won't be able to deal with this backlog because the cost of treatment is not matched by the fees that they're receiving from the government. So will the Minister take it up with the Health Secretary to ensure the new fee regime does reflect the cost of treatment so we can deal with this backlog. As briefly as possible, Cabinet Secretary. Well, the Government obviously reviews all of these issues on an ongoing basis, and um, uh, I'll, I'll look with care at the points that uh, Mr Rennie makes, but uh, you know, I, I do have to put on the record, as I've said to Parliament on countless occasions, there are financial constraints in which we're operating. We are trying to support public services to the greatest effect that we possibly can do, um, but there will be challenges in dealing with the recovery from um, COVID and the significant backlogs that will exist as a consequence of the absence of treatment for so many people for so long. And question six, Jenny Minto. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government how its COVID recovery strategy is supporting third sector organisations in rural and island communities such as Argyll and Butte to improve health support, including for people with long COVID. Cabinet Secretary. Presiding Officer, the third sector is supported across each local authority through third sector interfaces, which offer a variety of development needs and provide a voice into local decision making structures, including health and social care partnerships and integrated joint boards. Increasingly, third sector interfaces are involved in brokering new services across boundaries and managing funds for local partners. For example, in Argyll and Butte, there are over 200 health and social care related services being delivered by the third sector with support from the third sector interface. Jenny Minto. I thank the Deputy First Minister for his answer. During the COVID-19 pandemic, we saw innovative community-led activity to support community resilience. This worked particularly well in, remote, sorry, in rural and island communities of Argyll and Butte, where people have a strong sense of community spirit and social capital. For example, they know their neighbours and who might be vulnerable or, or at risk. The community planning structures provided a framework for mobilising this support, but there is much learning that can be gained from putting power into local communities. How can the role and power of communities be strengthened for future community resilience? Cabinet Secretary. 
think one of the, important, the most important points is that we need to make sure we lose none of the ways of working that were so prevalent in our communities, particularly in rural and island communities, that have been highlighted in the original answer from Jenny Minto. And I think those services and those approaches should be enabled by the work of community planning partnerships. One of the priorities of the COVID Recovery Programme Board has been to work with the community planning infrastructure around Scotland, which exists in every local authority area, to bring together organisations and through the third sector interface to make sure the availability and the opportunities of third sector activity to enhance this provision um, are clearly understood and articulated. And I can assure um, Jenny Minto that that work uh, has high priority within government to make sure that the vital work of community organisations is uh, significant as we make, take the steps to recover from COVID. Okay, and a number of supplementaries uh, as briefly as possible. First, Murdo Fraser. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. And if you'd indulge me for a second, as I understand this may be uh, the last COVID recovery questions, uh, which I'll be shadowing uh, the Deputy First Minister, can I just recognise all the effort he has put into that role uh, over the past uh, number of years and our mostly cordial exchanges uh, here in the chamber and also in committee, which I'm sure will continue with him uh, on the back benches. But in relation to the question, the uh, COVID Recovery Committee has heard from uh, long COVID sufferers, from, including those from rural and island communities, who have been very clear in their view that the number one ask they would have is for the introduction of long COVID clinics in Scotland to reflect what happens elsewhere in the United Kingdom. Will the Deputy First Minister, in his last few weeks in the role, consider whether these can be introduced? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I'm grateful to Mr Fraser for his uh, kind remarks, and uh, I look forward to deploying um, what contribution I can make to Parliament in the years to come from the back benches, where um, I, I look forward to questioning Government Ministers on the way in which they uh, deport their responsibilities and to ensure for Dr Gulhani and Mr Kerr's benefit that there is proper accountability in Parliament. <laughs> I shall ensure single-handedly from my parliamentary perspective. In relation to the, the I, I recognise the, the substance of the issue that Mr Fraser raises about long COVID and long COVID clinics. And these issues are being examined to determine whether or not long COVID clinics are the appropriate way forward. But what, what is absolutely essential is that anybody experiencing long COVID should, through their interaction with the general practice system in Scotland, be able to access healthcare services that will meet their needs. And their needs will vary depending on how long COVID has affected those individuals. But in all circumstances, they should be able to have access to the appropriate level of care and support. And I certainly assure Mr Fraser that I will uh, use my remaining period in office to ensure that that is the case. I think I can confirm, Mr Swinney, that Mr Ewing has a seat safely secured for you up at the back. Um, uh, Jackie Bailey. <laughs> um, Long Covid Scotland tell us that one in five Covid sufferers have actually been forced to go private for tests and investigations because there is a lack of access to NHS services. We now know that there are 175,000 people living with Long Covid. That's three times more than when the government announced £3 million for services specific for that. So will the Scottish Government increase the funding because that's what's necessary to help support those with long COVID. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, if, President Officer, you'll forgive me for a second. Um, I, I do want to make clear that I will make my own choices about where I sit in this parliament <laughs> in the foreseeable future. Um, in relation to the point, I certainly will sit nowhere near Jackie Bailey, I can tell you that. <laughs> um, the, in the, um, uh, uh, I, I am nothing but I am nothing but candid to Parliament. It's all part of my belief in parliamentary scrutiny and accountability, <laughs> which I've championed all my days. Um, in relation to the, Jackie Bailey asked me to increase the funding. I wonder if Jackie Bailey was paying attention to the budget, because the budget increased the funding to the National Health Service by a billion pounds, and it wouldn't have happened if I hadn't taken the tough decisions to increase tax. And Jackie Bailey, as always, and this is a piece of parliamentary feedback, that the running commentary from Jackie Bailey, who speaks throughout your answers when, you, when she's not listening to the answers being given carefully by government ministers, and she's also doing it again as I continue to give my answer, and will continue on this farrago of nonsense for as long as it takes me for Jackie Bailey to stop talking while I'm answering the question presiding officer, and I may, so I may be here a long time. No, you won't, officer. Mr Swinney. But the point, 
longer than I anticipate being here, <laughs> presiding officer. But the key point to Jackie Bailey is the funding has increased for the National Health Service, and that can be deployed to meet the needs of individuals within our society, which is what it's intended to do. I'm briefly Beatrice Wisher. <laughs> Um, I've met with several constituents living with long COVID, some of them known as, as first waivers, and they've told me that they felt that the support wasn't there when they needed it. And this impacts on family life too, with breadwinners unable to work and children who are coping with the enormous change in their lives as a consequence of having a parent with long COVID. What more can be done to support those living with long COVID and those within their households? And briefly as possible, I think the, the, the key point here is to make sure that for those who are suffering from long COVID, they, they obtain the clinical interventions that they require. And as I answered Mr Fraser earlier on, that will vary from individual to individual. So it's vital, that, and that's why the increase in funding for the National Health Service is important, that it enables the Health Service to better meet the needs of individuals and their clinical issues. In relation to the family context that Beatrice Wishart raises, which is very important, there will, of course, be a wide range of services available within the community, and I'm very familiar with some of the carers' support services in, uh, in, in Shetland, which I've always admired over the years. They are very, very good community-based services that they will be available to support families in, in, in those circumstances. So it will be a mix of clinical and non-clinical interventions. But crucially, we've got to make sure that that focuses on the needs of individuals and families, which is right at the heart of the COVID recovery strategy. Question 7, Jeremy Balfour. Uh, thank you, Deputy President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government whether any post-legislative reviews of the Coronavirus Recovery and Reform Scotland Act 2022 are being conducted. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, they are. The 2022 Act includes a range of temporary justice measures which are due to expire in November this year. Under the terms of the Act, Ministers must review the operation of each, each temporary measure before it expires to inform a decision on whether it should be extended for a further year. If seeking any extension, Ministers must lay regulations to amend the expiry date alongside a statement setting out the findings of the review, allowing for full parliamentary scrutiny. The remainder of the Act comprises permanent provisions and no post-legislative review is currently planned. Jeremy Balfour. Uh, can I also wish uh, the Cabinet Secretary all the best as he returns to the back benches? But Cabinet Secretary, uh, the Coronavirus Recovery and Reform Bill gives Scottish Ministers the power to release prisoners early, even before they have completed their sentence. This power was used dis disastrously by the SNP government during the pandemic, where they released hundreds of offenders, at least 40% of whom went on to re-offend. Yet despite this, the SNP government want to give themselves this permanent power to release prisoners early in the bail and release from custody Scotland bill. Will the Cabinet Secretary commit to taking out this provision from the bail and release from custody bill until a review has been conducted of whether this power is necessary and the reform of this act takes place. Cabinet Secretary. Well, there will, of course, be full parliamentary scrutiny of the provisions that Mr Balfour has put forward, um, and there will be ample opportunity for that scrutiny to take place so Parliament can determine on these questions, and Ministers will, of course, engage on that subject. And question eight, Jackie Dunbar. To ask the Scottish Government whether it plans to propose the scheduling of time for a ministerial statement on compulsory sale orders. Minister George Adam. Thank you, President Officer, and I thank Jackie DeBar for the question. Any proposal for government business in Parliament as ag are agreed by the Scottish Cabinet, subject to consideration by the Parliamentary Bureau and in turn approval by the Parliament. I am aware that Mr Dunbar will have heard the Cabinet Secretary for Social Justice, Housing and Local Government speak about compulsory sales order during January's housing debate. The Cabinet Secretary highlighted the need for any new powers to be compliant with the European Convention on Human Rights and, careful con and the careful consideration that this requires. Jackie Dunbar. I thank the Minister for his answer. Compulsory sale orders, when introduced, will allow local authorities additional powers to deal with both vacant, derelict and abandoned land and buildings, and will allow a greater ability to tackle private absentee landowners. This could mean that the eyesore of log logie shops in my constituency could be taken over and turned into a useful community asset. Can the Minister advise on a timescale for the introduction of CSOs? Minister. 
Thank you very much. And as Paisley's MSP, I can feel uh, the member's pain on this issue. But as I mentioned, the ECHR implications for compulsory sale orders need careful consideration. And I would suggest that Jackie Dunbar contact the Cabinet Secretary for Social Justice, Housing and Local Government to talk through the detail. It may be that compulsory purchase could be a suitable vehicle to tackle the issue in the meantime. But I would encourage Aberdeen City Council to make contact with officials in the Scottish Government to discuss this further. Thank you, Minister. That concludes portfolio questions on COVID-19 recovery and parliamentary uh, business. We will now move on to the next portfolio, which is finance and the economy. Uh, I would encourage members who wish to ask a supplementary to press the request to speak buttons during the relevant question. And I call question number one, Maggie Chapman. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government whether it plans to define green jobs, including green energy jobs, to help ensure that investment and resources can be targeted to achieve a low carbon economy. Minister Richard Lockhead. The Scottish Government included a green jobs definition when the Green Jobs Fund was launched in 2021, with the aim of supporting businesses and their supply chains to help them better transition to a low carbon economy. And this definition ensured suitable projects could be identified and all green jobs created over the life of these projects accurately measured. Maggie Chapman. I thank the Minister for that response. Skills Development Scotland has highlighted that we talk much about the technical and practical skills required for our new economy, but rarely address the lack of meta skills, working with people, problem solving, and so on. These skills are in abundance in jobs that should be considered green jobs, those in health and social care, culture, for example. These are low carbon jobs and will remain the foundation of our new low carbon economy and society. Will the Minister commit to redefining green jobs across all sectors and also to engage with workers, especially those with fewer opportunities for retraining and reskilling, who already possess the meta skills necessary for the success of Scotland's new economy? Minister. The member raises a very important point, and I will certainly reflect on the argument she makes. Um, as she will be aware, there are several definitions of green jobs at the moment, not just in this country, but throughout the UK and Europe and the rest of the world. And indeed, at UK level, the Scottish Government has been engaging with the Office of National Statistics, to, who are currently reviewing their definition because the current definition is out of date and with the efforts towards net zero and all the new jobs that have been created, it's really important that we have an up-to-date definition of green jobs. Um, so I'll certainly take on board the, the points raised by the member as we move forward with this debate. A lot of interest on this question. I'll try to get all the supplementaries in, but they will need to be brief, as will the responses. First, Gillian Martin. Thank you very much. Uh, the Minister is well aware of my report on Just Transition, which outlined the issues that oil and gas workers have in trans transitioning. Could you provide an update on the work the Scottish Government is carrying out to achieve taking down those barriers for them transitioning to, to low-carbon jobs? Minister. Well, as the member will no doubt be aware, we have our Just Transition Planning Framework, which is a world first and our first sector-based plan, which is the Draft Energy Strategy and Just Transition Plan, is currently under consultation until May. I know the member, Gillian Martin, takes a very close interest, given her constituency interest in the offshore industry in North East Scotland, um, and I'd urge everyone to submit to that consultation. But we're also working with communities, businesses and workers as we develop further sector-based plans, with drafts being published before the end of the year alongside the Climate Change Plan, and that will cover areas like um, buildings and construction, uh, land use and agriculture uh, and transport. So there's a lot of work taking place to, to be, meet the, the concerns expressed by Julian Martin. Liam Kerr. An independent report suggests that this government's approach to achieving net zero will cut Scottish oil and gas and low carbon GVA from 19 billion to 12 billion by 2050 as a direct result of a reduction in jobs conservatively estimated as going from 57,000 to 32,000 by 2030 and those jobs that remain will be on a far lower average salary. Therefore, rather than gaming definitions to appease the Green Coalition partners, does the Minister agree that this government's time would be much better spent revising its threadbare energy strategy? Minister. Can I tell the member I spend a great deal of time talking to companies in the offshore sector and energy sector in the north-east of Scotland and the members' region, uh, perhaps more than, than he does. And what I hear back from them is that they see massive job opportunities in the journey towards net zero. And indeed, RGU and other institutions have predicted that we could have a net gain in jobs in north-east Scotland if we get this right in the coming decades. Irrespective of his party's policies or my party's policies, the north-east province is in decline 
and therefore these jobs have to be replaced. That is unavoidable, and that is why it is so important we do have a just transition and make sure over the next 20 years we have good green jobs for people to move into and transition into so they can continue to be in employment. Briefly, Daniel Johnson. So, yesterday at Finance Committee saw the spring budget review cut uh, 68.5 million from the net zero budget due to apparently a lack of demand. And while the number of completions is down, the number of surveys last year was 20 per cent up. So does that not suggest rather than a lack of demand, it's a lack of ability to deliver on that demand that is actually throttling back our delivery against these key and vital funds to deliver net zero in Scotland's buildings and homes? Minister. Uh, Patrick Harvey, the Minister responsible, is putting together a very ambitious plan in terms of decarbonising buildings and homes in Scotland that has the potential to create thousands and thousands of new jobs across all our communities in Scotland. But I should highlight the recent research that was published by Skills Development Scotland, working with Warwick University and Strathclyde University, that says in Scotland we now have up to 100,000 new green jobs in this country. There are other reports that say that Scotland is ahead of the rest of the UK in terms of progress over the creation of green jobs as well. So I think we're in a good place. There's a lot of work to be done, but there's evidence there we are creating good green jobs in this country. Hey, question number two, Fiona Hislop. To ask the Scottish Government what its initial assessment is of any potential impacts that the Windsor framework may have on Scotland's economy. Minister Ivan McKee. Uh, clearly, the Scottish Government welcomes this framework in terms of its importance to wider relations in Northern Ireland and between the EU and the UK. Some businesses which trade with Northern Ireland may face fewer barriers to trade. This may provide welcome relief for Scotland's world-renowned seed potato industry, for example, which has been harmed so badly by Brexit. But this framework does not resolve burdensome Brexit barriers for Scotland, while Northern Ireland, of course, will still benefit from being part of the single market. Scotland must get the right to choose our own future that does take us back into the EU with all the benefits that will generate. Many of us for many years have supported the specific needs of Northern Ireland, recognised how precious peace is and the need to restore a functioning democratic assembly at Stormont and welcome the breakthrough on this issue, which is needed to remedy a problem of the UK government's own making. But does the minister agree that it would be blinkered to not understand that this will have a knock-on impact on Scotland's economy? And although many of us are of the view that full access to the single market for trade is an unbelievably special position, a prize, as the Prime Minister puts it. Are there any short-term measures the Scottish Government can take to protect Scottish SMEs from the competitive advantage that Northern Ireland now has? Minister. Uh, the Windsor framework clearly represents a welcome improvement in conditions for the Northern Irish economy, which will now have lower barriers to trade with businesses in Britain. This could benefit the many Scottish businesses trading with Northern Ireland. However, we should not forget that Northern Irish firms will continue to have a competitive advantage over Scottish firms trading with the EU because of their access to the large and lucrative single market that Scotland was forcibly removed from. This is just another of the many consequences uh, of Brexit, the only solution to which is for Scotland to rejoin the EU as an independent nation. The Scottish Government continues to provide support to our businesses and is in focused on delivering our 10-year export growth strategy, a trading nation which remains firmly focused on the recovery and growth of Scotland's exports through values-based trade and our trading relationships with the EU remain central both now and in Scotland's future. And supplementary list, uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. May I indulge uh, your patience again and the Minister's uh, patience? as uh, this is the first formal occasion in the chamber since John Swinney intimated his intention to step down as Deputy First Minister that I've had the opportunity to wish him well in the future. Whether in education or in finance over a very long period of time, I've certainly enjoyed our feisty exchanges in this chamber, even if we have seldom agreed on anything. But can I ask uh, the Minister, in relation to the Windsor Agreement, does he at least acknowledge that one of the benefits is a much improved working relationship between the UK government and the EU, which is something that his colleague, Mr Swinney, has often called for. As briefly as possible, Minister. Yes, indeed, that is the case, and I think I've made clear in my answer that we welcome the agreement. Um, it clearly, it uh, 
remains the case that there are still restrictions. Um, fewer, but there are still some restrictions with trade uh, to Northern Ireland. But of course, as the Prime Minister himself said, it puts Northern Ireland in a very advantageous position with regards to having a foot in both uh, the UK and EU markets, a position that uh, we believe uh, competitively disadvantages Scotland, and it's something that Scotland should uh, be able to realise as well. Thank you. Question number three, Coca Stewart, who joins us remotely. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. I would like to ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on the implementation of the fourth national planning framework since its adoption on the 13th of February 2023. Minister Tom Arthur. Presiding Officer, I was delighted to adopt NPF 4 on 13 February. It is now part of the development plan and will be influential in all planning decisions. In just a short time, good progress has already been made on key actions from the delivery programme, and I have published a letter outlining transitional arrangements to support early implementation. I will shortly lay regulations in this Parliament setting out the arrangements for new style local development plans, and so complete the, re the reforms of the development planning system. Nature Scott has recently published guidance to support application of NPF 4 policy on biodiversity and further guidance, including on 20-minute neighbourhoods and short-term lets, is in preparation. Cook up, Stuart. I thank the Minister for that answer. Um, NPF 4 could be the key to making Scotland's places more sustainable, livable and productive. And it is indeed heartwarming to see progress in the effective delivery of these new policies. Um, but as councils begin reviewing their local development plans to align with NPF 4, can the Minister outline the new planning system will accelerate uh, Scotland's well-being economy? Minister. Our national spatial strategy will support the planning and delivery of productive places where we have a greener, fairer and more inclusive well-being economy. We will actively encourage investment where it is needed most by rebalancing development, playing to the economic strengths and opportunities of each part of Scotland. NPF 4 encourages councils in the preparation of local development plans to allocate a broad range of sites for business and industry, taking into account local economic strategies and priorities. This also supports broader objectives of delivering a low carbon and net zero economic recovery and supporting community wealth and Scotland's wellbeing economy. I will lay regulations in the Parliament shortly, which will set the arrangements for preparation of a new generation of place-focused local development plans, which we will support with guidance on how councils can deliver on the ambitions in NPF 4 through their own plans. Uh, a brief supplementary, Stephanie Callaghan. President officer, officer, I'd like to ask the Minister if Planning Advice Note 2011, 2011 and Associated Technical Advice Note 2011 on noise will be updated as part of the fourth National Planning Framework, and if so, will these take the World Health Organisation noise recommendations into consideration? Briefly as possible, Minister. With some substantial changes being made through the reform of our planning system, including a new, na a new policy framework in NPF 4, I recognise there will now be some discrepancies in existing planning guidance and advice as a result. There will remain aspects of gu existing guidance which, are, will still, which will still be useful for reference through the new planning system and policy approach. And over time, we will review the historic advice as appropriate. Question four, Kenneth Gibson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what the cost of the public purse will be of private finance initiatives and public-private partnerships in 2023-24, and how this compares to 2022-23. Cabinet Secretary. President, so the latest published data shows that the total estimated payment cost of private finance initiative and public-private partnership contracts is £1.46 billion pounds in 2023-24 and £1.41 billion in the year before that. That is an increase of around £50 million. Pounds. Uh, broken down, we see a cost increase in PFI contracts of £47.6 million, in NPD contracts prior to 2010 of £1 million, pounds, and in NPD hub programme contracts of £1.8 million. Pounds. The majority of PFI payments are indexed linked and rise by inflation each year, while most NPD and hub payments are not, making them less sensitive to inflation. Kenneth Gibbs. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that reply, and while he is standing down from government now, I hope that he will indeed soon return. Does he share my concerns that the 75 remaining PFI and PPP schemes will now cost an additional £770 million 
to the termination of the contracts all to be borne by the taxpayer. And what does that say, Cabinet Secretary, about the financial recklessness and short-sightedness of Labour and the Lib Dems who bequeathed these schemes to the people of Scotland 16 years ago and for which taxpayers will continue to pay for many years to come? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I, I, I sympathise entirely with the point of view and agree with the point of view put forward by Mr Gibson. Uh, as Mr Gibson will know, uh, this Government brought to an end the PFI scheme because it simply did not deliver value for money. Um, we introduced more affordable schemes and, as well as stopping the excessive profits, NPD hub payments are largely not index-linked. And This is a crucial point, which is at the heart of the question that Mr Gibson puts to me. The folly of linking the PFI schemes to inflation, which benefited those providing the finance, has resulted in an inflationary climate in excessive profits being made, which were baked into the contracts by the Labour and Liberal ministers who approved these contracts. These are fiscal folly, and I'm glad that we've taken the measures that we've taken to reduce the, uh, the, the, the drain that they represent on the public purse if they had been carried on. But, of course, we are paying for the legacy of those mistakes. And brief supplementary, Alexander Stewart. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The SNP like to point the finger at wasted expenditure from decades ago, but their own track record on this front isn't exactly glowing. What lies behind this question is the relative inefficiency and ineffectiveness of the Scottish Government's ability to deliver projects. Therefore, what is the Scottish Government doing to ensure that, going forward, financial assessments are carried out to provide best value for the public purse? As briefly as possible, Cabinet Secretary. I have absolutely no idea what that question was about. Because I, came, I was up in Aberdeen this morning. I saw... I saw. I didn't go. I didn't go on. I didn't go on the Aberdeen Western Peripheral Route. Mr. Burnett is sitting right behind, beside Mr. Stewart. The Aberdeen Western Peripheral Route. I saw the junction. I didn't go on that route. I went to Robert Gordon University. Beautiful building. Aberdeen Western Peripheral Route delivered. I came down the road. I came over the Queen's Ferry Crossing. Where did that come from? Where on earth did the Queen's Ferry Crossing come from? Delivered on time, on budget by this government, and Mr. Stewart should thank us for it. Question number five, Stuart McMillan. Thank you, Jenny Officer, to ask the Scottish Government what financial support, in addition to local government settlement, will be allocated to Inverclyde Council in 2023-24, and how this compares to 2022-23. Cabinet Secretary. President Officer, at this stage I can confirm that Inverclyde Council will receive £201.9 million to fund vital day-to-day -day services from the settlement which is an extra £5.3 million, or 2.7 per cent, compared to 2022-23. In addition, they will receive their fair share of the undistributed sum of £329.8 million, which includes the extra £223 million announced as part of the Stage 3 of the Budget Bill. All councils, including Inverclyde, will receive additional funding from individual portfolios in year over and above the local government settlement, but it is too early to say how much and how this will compare with the current year. Stuart McMillan. I thank the Deputy First Minister for that reply. And the Deputy First Minister will be well aware of the economic and social challenges facing Inverclyde, and with the Clyde Green Freeport bid narrowly missing out on becoming one of the two freeports in Scotland, I would like to ask the Deputy First Minister what additional support the Scottish Government can and will provide to Inverclyde to attract investment to the district, and will the Scottish Government still consider a detailed business case from Inverclyde Council to help address the 40 plus years of managed economic and social decline? And my constituency has suffered from. Cabinet Secretary. I, I, I understand the disappointment in the Inverclyde area at the unsuccessful bid in relation to the Green Freeport uh, process, but um, I do assure Mr McMillan that a rigorous and dispassionate process was undertaken by Scottish and United Kingdom government ministers and officials in that respect. There are a range of measures that are taken forward to support the Inverclyde economy. The Minister for Business, Trade and Tourism and Enterprise continues to engage with the Inverclyde Task Force. There is, of course, the um, city-region deal for the, um, the, the Glasgow and surrounding area, which um, delivers substantial investment in the Inverclyde area. Uh, and obviously, there is um, investment that will be taken forward through the Clyde Mission, which will have an effect on the Inverclyde area into the bargain. But I would say to Mr uh, McMillan that the Government will, of course, consider any further measures uh, that are suggested by the Council um, as we work to try to improve and strengthen the Inverclyde economy in the foreseeable future. 
Okay, we've got three more questions on the order paper. I want to get through all of them, but the uh, responses and indeed the questions need to be slightly briefer and I won't be able to take any supplementaries. Uh, question number six, Marie McNair. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what assessment is made of any cost pressure on council budgets relating to private finance initiative and public-private uh, partnership contracts. Cabinet Secretary. So the Government recognises the challenging financial circumstances that local authorities and indeed the entire public sector are currently facing. These challenges were considered and reflected in the Scottish Budget decisions, which will provide local authorities with nearly £13.5 billion in 2023 24 including over £793 million of additional revenue funding. And the Scottish Futures Trust continue to work with local public authorities in Scotland to assist in making savings and improving performance across PFI and PPP contracts. Marie McNair. I thank the Deputy First Minister for that answer. And figures provided to me by Western Bartonshire Council alone will need to pay £15.9 million a year for many years to come. By the end of the contracts, this is estimated to have cost £437 million, going on double the Council's total revenue budget for education, social work and other services. Does the Deputy First Minister agree with me that this new Labour-imposed funding mechanism is continue to be financially debilitating to Council's draining resources that could be spent elsewhere? Briefly as possible, Cabinet Secretary. Uh, Marie Manier makes a very fair point. The financial burden of these contracts is um, a millstone uh, around a number of local authorities in Scotland. Uh, these contracts were far too expensive. They have far too much um, uh, costs over a longer period of time, and the costs are now having a very real effect in eroding the budgets of local authorities at this time. Question 7, Mark Griffin. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government by how much local authority non-domestic rates bills will increase following revaluation of public sector properties based on rebuild costs used on the 1st of April 2022 tone date. Mr. Tom All properties will be revalued on 1st April 2023, including those in the public sector. Revaluations redistribute the tax base to reflect changes in the market circumstances and ensure fairness for all ratepayers. Many public sector properties are revalued using the contractor's method, taking into account rebuild costs which have increased since the tone date for the previous revaluation took effect. A revaluation summary report, which will include information broken down by property class, is expected to be published in 2023-24 once final values for the revaluation have been made. Mark Griffin. I thank the Minister for that answer. As he said, the contractor's method for determining rate will value using the real costs um, of um, recent new buildings is now passing artificially high values on to councils. They are now um, facing spiralling non-domestic rates bill. In South Lanarkshire, the bill has gone up by £2.9 million. Can I ask the Minister why the Government is using that method and passing on increased bills to local authorities at an extremely difficult time for them? Minister. Well, as, as a member will be aware, the matter of um, ascertaining RVs for non-domestic properties is for Scottish assessors who act independently in accordance with the legislation. With regards to the funding that has been provided to local government this year, it totals £13.5 billion, which is over £700 million above what was indicated in the RSR. And question 8, Alexander Burnett. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government how the Scottish Budget 23-24 will support the economic development and prosperity of the North East. Minister Richard Lockett. The Scottish Government is fully committed to supporting the economic development of the North East. The Budget will reflect a continued investment to ensure a just transition to net zero that supports business growth and creates job opportunities. And that includes the £500 million Just Transition Fund, £379 million for the Aberdeen City Region Deal and Side Package, £180 million for the Emerging Technologies Fund, £100 million for the Green Jobs Fund and £75 million for the Energy Transition Fund. And I could go on. Alexander Burnett. Uh, the SNP may claim they are delivering for communities in the North East, yet their policies undermine Scottish business. Absolutely. Policies like the Deposit Return Scheme, which will bring economic ruin to firms across Scotland. And one small business in my constituency, Essence of Huntley, is facing costs of £20,000 to implement DRS. So can I ask the Minister, why should businesses in the North East trust this SNP Government when time and time again they proceed with damaging or incompetent policies? Minister. 
Well, I just outlined to the member the unprecedented package of support for North East Scotland provided by the Scottish Government. And on the other issues mentioned by the member, ministers will, of course, continue to listen to business. But can I suggest to the member that he speaks to his own UK Government, who are holding back the Acorn carbon capture project, which will create thousands of jobs in his constituency in North East Scotland. Or indeed, his Government should match the Just Transition Fund provided by this Government to North East Scotland given they have taken over £300 billion out of the North Sea, can they perhaps give some of that back to invest in the North East of Scotland's future? Thank you very much, Minister. That concludes portfolio questions. There will be a brief pause to allow the front benches to change before we move on to the next item of business.